All right, everybody, I might start talking. People are still trickling in a little bit and we'll have a, you know, a few little moments of, of um, you know, pre, pre whatnot before we get into the, the presentation proper while people trickle in. Um, so while we're doing that, just a little bit of admin to start with. So the presentation is being recorded um, so that you are aware of that. Um, I would invite you please to uh, pop your questions and comments into the chat and I will come to those at the end. I do have, um, I'm going to try to keep myself to about 40 minutes if, if that for the, um, for the chat, um, for the presentation, and then I'll have a look at the chat at the end and answer what questions that I realistically can in doing so. Um, I won't be able to answer all questions and um, we will have a look at what we can respond to offline once we're finished. Everybody's cameras and microphones are automatically switched off and that's just so that we can protect our bandwidth um, and to avoid, you know, there's always one um, that turns on their microphone and just distracts everybody and I'm easily distractible so nobody wants that. Um, regarding the chat, no, I won't be watching the chat during the presentation because as we've just established, I'm easily distracted, um, but I will go back to that and I'll start from the first chat and scroll myself down um uh, so we can have a look at that uh, at the end and i promise i'll allow some time um hopefully you'll be able to see my face here um, and you've got the slides up on screen as well that you can see and we'll step through those um all right why not let's get cracking let me see if i can make these slides progress come on you know you want to there you go, let's try that. So, Wallawan in Ijuan, um, I am dialing in from Darwell land on the beautiful south coast of New South Wales. Um, I want to uh, pay my respect to the um, traditional custodians of this land, the people of the Yuan Nation down on the south coast, um, and extend my respects to their elders past and present. And I also would like to acknowledge and extend my respects to um, any uh, First Nations people who are joining us on the call this evening. Uh, Wadawan Idijiwan is um, local Darwin language where I live for um, thanking people for, for taking the time and effort and putting in the effort to journey to be with us here today. So what I'm gonna be talking about this evening is uh, demystifying AVMED, um, just I suppose stepping through some of the, the, the big topics as to when people have one of those Whiskey Tango Foxtrot AVMED moments, these are the ones that people will sort of come at us the most about. Um, so that's what we're gonna try to, um, to get into there today. I'll do a little recap of the first webinar I did, I think that was back in April, um, and then just go through an overview of the regs. And the idea of that is to help people perhaps understand some of the reasons why our decisions are the way they are and why they work that way. Then talk about um, aeromedical decision making and what is it that we as aerospace medicine specialists are doing and thinking and why. And then get into the nitty gritty of, you know, all of you who are certificate holders, why the hell is Qatar asking for that? What, why? Why do they need that? And then why won't they listen to me? Why won't they listen to my Damie? Why won't they listen to my specialist? That's a big one. And then finally, why are we so slow? Why is it taking so long to get my medical? That's what we're trying to do. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have some nice time for Q&A. Please be respectful. Please be kind. Um, everyone wants to get stuck into, um, into the PMO. I understand that. Um, I, do, I do have a heart. See, here it is right here. Do you like that? See, I'm in my in a doctor's office at the moment. So I do have a heart, um, even if you think I, I don't. So try to be kind, don't break my, my precious little heart. All right, so that was, uh, where are we? All right, so recap of part one, that's me. Wicked Witch of the West, my job is to, um, what do I say, my job is to um, break people's hearts and steal their dreams and cancel Christmas and um, and their birthdays and that kind of stuff. That's, that's my job, I'm the Wicked Witch, that's me before I put my makeup on in the mornings. And this is what I do. My job is to ground people. Oh, come on, Oprah, there you are. I ground people. That's what I do, right? That's what AVMED does. That is uh, what people take away. And that's what we talked about in our first webinar um, is, in fact, that we uh, we don't quite do as much of that as people think. And by the numbers, when we look at the, the numbers, um, I had the, the privilege of spending the weekend with um, the team from air services, so the air traffic controllers and the firefighters doing a peer support um, training session with a number of um, uh, Damies uh, as well. 
And one of the things that one of the air traffic controllers shared was that, that he didn't really realise that, in fact, the vast majority of people who have an aviation medical certificate application, they get that medical. So every year there's only about three out of every thousand certificates that end up not being ones that we can issue. Um, otherwise, everybody everybody gets their medical. Um, and you often hear the, the idea that, you know, why don't we do it the way that other regulators do and particularly referencing the FAA. So this, the Federal Air Surgeon um, presented some data for us. It was actually this year, uh, sorry, this year she presented her 2023 data that they also are on a par with us. So they're not um, they're not better or kinder or more generous. We're actually pretty well aligned with the way the FAA does things for their final denials as well. So snap on that. So that's a little bit of a recap of part one. So um, first of all, let's talk about some regulations. And this is uh, so that you can hopefully appreciate um, the regs that we have to comply with. And they are, you know, we, we, they're not discretionary. We have to follow this. So um, we have to issue certificates if someone meets the standard. And we also have to consider whether or not, even if they don't meet the medical standard under Part 67, we absolutely have to look at whether or not we can find a way to make it so that they can, uh, they can have a certificate anyway. And that's about not likely to endanger the safety of air navigation. That's our flexibility provisions. That's our opportunity to find a way to say yes to someone's aviation medical certificate. And that's uh, that's what we have to do. Um, the other thing that is really important that we um, that we pay attention to is the principle of safety relevance. So if someone has a disease or a healthcare status, we need to know whether or not it's safety relevant, which means that it will cause them to be unable to exercise the privileges of their license in a safe way. I'm going to unpack that in a lot of detail later. But again, these are the things that we've got to think about, not whether or not they feel well or not whether or not their doctor says they're good to go, but whether or not it will impair them and stop them from being able to exercise the privilege of their licence. And a really important piece in there, if it is or is likely to reduce the ability of someone to exercise their privileges. So um, we have to crystal ball that a little bit and do some predictions and some um, uh, some likelihood assessments for that. And I'll talk about risk assessment in a minute. And then the next one on the regs is part 11. So again, we have the option to look for ways to make it safe and we can put conditions on certificates. This is probably one of the commonest reasons people get cross with us is that um, it's not about having the cancellations and refusals. They're actually quite rare. As we've said, three out of a thousand is not many. But the ones that people get cross with us is when they have a condition on their certificate. So particularly things like with safety pilot or multi-crew or proximity for the class ones and threes. Um, or it might be that um, they have to do certain blood tests or something like that during the period of their license so that we can make sure their condition is not or is not likely to causing a problem um, that makes it unsafe and then we can't issue a certificate. So the conditions under 11056, people get upset with us about those sometimes, unfortunately. Then going up the tree, in the regulatory tree, um, ICAO, you know, it's a thing. We have to comply with ICAO because we want to play nicely with the rest of the aviation world. And so in doing that, ICAO also tells us that we've got to make sure that people are safe. Even if they don't meet the medical standard, then we just got to make sure that they're safe in doing that. And we also have to think about the operational conditions. So again, that's if there's any limitations or restrictions. Um, unfortunately, ICAO uses the word endorse, which is write it on the certificate. Endorsements, uh, you know, the, the language can get a bit confusing. Is it an endorsement, a condition, a restriction, a limitation? It's all a different way of saying there's things that you can and can't do. It's not a what we call a clean certificate. So these are all the rules that are there to help us to find a way to keep you flying. And these are the rules that are there that we have to follow. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot more to Part 67 than just the ones that I've shared, but um, but there you go. So in summary, you've got to be safe if you don't meet the standard, or you've got to be not unsafe and not likely to be unsafe. And what is safe anyway? It's got to be acceptably safe. To who? Who decides? What's that about? That's that's a big philosophical argument and, and um, that is about what is acceptable for 
the National Aviation Authority, what is acceptable for the community. It's a cultural concept. It is uh, what is accepted um, in terms of risk and consequences and so on. That's a hard one to say. And that's where we follow the risk appetite of the organisation, which is set by the community. All right, so that's a bit of a recap, a bit of an overview of the regs that we do have to follow. Now, aeromedical decision making, when we're applying those regs and thinking about what is safe and when can it be safe and how can it be safe, we're looking at whether or not this person can do all the things they need to be able to do that are necessary for them to be able to fly safely whenever they're flying at all. So the circumstances under which they're flying, that's all the stuff that we are thinking about. So um, ultimately, if they can do all of the things that are necessary and it's all good, then it's okay, not safety relevant. And if they can't do them, then that's a problem. It's safety relevant. If only it was always black and white like that, most of the time, well, it depends on what do you mean by properly? How impaired are they? What are the things that you think that they need to be able to do? Is everything necessary? Is that thing necessary? Maybe it's not that necessary. Maybe it depends on the circumstances. What aircraft are they flying? How are they flying it? Where are they flying it? When are they flying it? Uh, do they have a safety pilot or not? All of that sort of thing. So there's a lot of it depends that we need to figure it out. So um, there we are. So figuring it out, what are we doing? So I'm going to go through each of those, those things in red there so that we can have a look at what are we doing. So the first thing is this person can't properly do things. So what is this disease or symptom or treatment or side effect do or possibly do to people? And how does that make it so that they can't properly do things? How does that impair them? How does that incapacitate them? How much does it do that to them and how often? It does it happen all the time? Does it only happen once in a blue moon? And when it does happen, is it absolutely devastatingly awful or is it just a little niggle? And can we crystal ball that? Can we predict? Because remember, remember that safety relevance is about is it likely to? So I need to be able to predict that with some reliability. Is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? How often is it going to happen? How bad is it going to be when it happens? And then because we're doing risk assessment for our decision making, can we treat that risk? Can we prevent it? Is there anything we can do to control or support that at all? And then all of those fundamentals are about this case. So we're not treating uh, numbers in textbooks. We are treating individual people. Um, and I'll talk about the difference between, you know, the textbook approach and the individualised case-by-case approach and why it is case-by-case case is good, but it is labour intensive. All right, so this person can't properly do something. What are the things? They need to do all the things that are necessary. And so they need to do um, aviate, navigate, communicate, and of course, self-medicate and litigate. That's always in there. They need to be able to do it on a normal day, the sunny Sunday afternoon weekend warrior. They need to be able to do it when things are getting a bit untidy, uh, when there's turbulence or when there's you know low light conditions and uh, low contrast or... Um, when they're, you know, maybe they're a bit tired or maybe maybe their symptoms are flaring up a little bit, but it's still a bit challenging. They need to do it in all of the flights and all of the operations and all the contexts that they're allowed to do it in uh, with this certificate. So that's a big deal. So are they? do they have the endorsements or the qualifications and, and so on for, for IFR? Do they do formation flying? Are they doing aerobatics, um, high performance and high G aircraft, um, uh, pressurised aircraft, multi-engine aircraft, rotary wing, of course, is, um, is pretty fancy. Any other special kind of operations, aerial application or mustering? What are the things that this person is doing and what do they need to be able to do? And does this disease prevent them from doing those? We've got to put all of that together. That's why it's so complicated and so challenging to, to put it together. Um, in all circumstances, so if I give, if we issue a clean class one or class two certificate, then they will be able to do anything that that licence allows. Even if they say to us, look, I've got, I've got, a, I've got an R22, it's, it's not that fancy an aircraft, it doesn't go that high, it's not a big deal, um, why won't you give me a clean certificate? And it's because that clean certificate doesn't say, well, it's clean. So it doesn't say only for 
VH blah, 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 only for R22, only for this thing. You can do whatever you like. You can go and borrow John Travolta 707 and fly that if you like in all sorts of different places. You are allowed to do that. And that's what our certificate permits. So they're the operations that we need to think, well, what are they going to do? What could they possibly do? Remember I talked about both um, Part 11 and ICAO saying, well, maybe we should put some you know, boundaries around that to make it so that I can't give you a class one that's a free for all, but I can give you a class one with some limitations on it. Uh, if that is a way to make it safe, and that goes back to that ICAO, um, having regard to all the, the circumstances in which you're flying. So these are the things that we're going through for the risk assessment. And again, in all circumstances, people come to us and say, but I, I wouldn't do that. So that's not a problem. But I don't fly that aircraft. So that's not a problem. That would never happen. That's a tricky one. Um, uh, to share a little anecdote, um, I, I had an experience when I was in the military where there was an accident investigation and called into question the serviceability or the suitability of a certain configuration of the aircraft, or sorry, a part of the aircraft that would really only be an issue if they ditched. So um, essentially what they were saying is, well, that's okay, it's safe, we just won't crash. That was their risk treatment, it's just not crash. Okay, so we do need to think realistically, is it something that could happen that we need to think about? And we can't we can't just you know pretend that's not going to happen, right? Hope is not a plan. I hope it won't happen. Well, hope is not a plan. Um, so all the circumstances, and of course the circumstances, including if you do have an impairment or an exacerbation, if that thing that we're trying to manage does happen, it's not about whether you feel fine today. Remember, it is about that likely to happen, not just it is happening now. And we want to do it safely. And like I said before, what does that even mean? What is safe? What is unsafe? Is a bit of sleepiness safe or unsafe? Is profound, severe um, sleep deprivation? You know, we, we, we do have a, a sense of the really, really down the red end and the, the perfectly fine up the green end, but there's a whole bunch of grey khaki in the middle so where is that? Where is the cutoff? Where is the threshold? So we have what's called the 1% the rule in aviation um, and aviation risk assessment, which is a derivation that's related to um, the cardiovascular, the risk of cardiovascular impairment causing a fatal accident in commercial aviation. Yeah, and the derivation of the 1% rule, you know, none of the doctors on this call are really going to enjoy it if I start talking about that, so let's not. Um, but... What has done that 1% rule is that it has stood the test of time. So we're getting on to 50 years of the 1% rule. And I think we can safely say that the global aviation community is reasonably satisfied with the level of safety that we have in the community. So uh, we use the 1% rule. Now, maybe it could go to 2% or 3%. Um, we don't know if that would be safe, but we do know the 1% is tolerably safe. And that's one of the, the tricky things about risk acceptance, risk appetite and risk tolerance is what we don't want to do is to push that out to 20%, see what happens. Oh, that's too many crashes. Let's wind it back because the test, the trial of life is not a trial that we're willing to tolerate in the aviation safety community. So, so what impairment, what level, what likelihood is safe or unsafe? That's where we've got our percentage risk. So risk management then, you know, we... we Many of us have had a look at risk management as a, as a principle and a fundamental, and of course, there's a lot of experts in risk management. We're looking at all these different things here. So what could possibly go wrong? How likely is that to happen? If it does happen, how bad will it be? Is there anything we can do to stop that from going on? Those risk treatments are really important. We've got to talk about that. And once that's all in place, what is the bottom line here? What's the residual risk? And how does that map against what we're willing to accept in terms of what is safe or unsafe? And that's when we accept it or we refuse it. Treatments, if we just drive, dive into treatments a little bit, treatments have got to be present, suitable, operating and effective. This is the health check of your risk treatments or your risk management. So when we do an aeromedical risk treatment, it's present because we've written it on the certificate. Now, does that really make it present? It's just words on a piece of paper. But there it is. It's suitable. We hope it's suitable. What we do is say, well, if we apply that risk treatment, is that going to manage likelihood consequence? Yes, we think it will, um, based on previous experience, based on some knowledge and things as well. So we make it suitable. 
it's operating, it's actually doing the job it needs to do. Now, this is a fun one to talk about and to unpack. I will write with Safety Pilot on the medical certificate. I am trusting that pilot that they will fly with a safety pilot. We do not have the sky police. We do not have people sort of stopping and saying, hey, whoop, whoop, pull over, land. I need to check and see if you've got somebody else in the aircraft with you. We don't do that. So it is on trust, which is interesting. Um, and, you know, how does that work for us? Well, so at a presentation earlier this year, um, a colleague had um, a helicopter mustering pilot. He was flying his R-22, um, uh, mustering his cattle out in Western Queensland. And CASA had put a uh, safety pilot limitation on his class two medical. And he goes to the doctor and he says, um, the doctor said, the dame, he says, safety pilot, hey, how's that working out for you? And the pilot said, yeah, it's fine. Move on. Is he flying with a safety pilot when he's mustering his cows? I don't know. We're trusting him that he is. We're trusting him that it's happening. Don't know. And then is it effective? Now, this is one of those retrospective things. Do we know it's actually working? What we really need is to analyse our safety incident data. And again, that comes back to trusting people to report when they have a safety incident. Everyone's supposed to report things. Hardly anyone does. That's a bit of a problem. So it's really hard for us to understand how effective our treat risk treatments are without gathering that safety data. So if you do have a safety incident, please report it to the ATSB so that we can know that you're as safe as we think you are and we can understand whether or not our risk treatments are working. You probably won't, but I'm just, I've got to ask, right? Okay. The other thing that we do have to think about, so it's the trust thing, is um, how well do, how confident are we that we have all of the information that we need to put it together? So when I say to the pilot at the medical, is there anything wrong with you? And they say, nope, I'm all good. It's a complete no to all medical. Is it really though? So um, some great research that was published by um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel William Hoffman from um, the United States that surveyed around about 5,000 pilots in North America um, found that 67 approximately percent of all of those pilots had uh, avoided seeking health care out of fear of loss of license, as in, you know, lying to themselves maybe that they were fine, and 27 percent of them disclosed, told the survey, anonymous survey, that they had withheld information from their medical examiner out of fear of loss of licence. So um, it's it's pretty prevalent that people are, are not providing us with all of the information with which we can make a really informed aeromedical risk assessment. But that's it is what it is. That's, uh, that's where it's at. We can only work with what we've got. Our challenge is to try to make it so that people are more likely to trust us. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Um, to make it so that we can support people to seek the help they need. And that's a whole different talk about trust and things, and um, maybe we'll do that another time. All right, next one. Why does CASA want that test? Why? Um, because, you know, like, you know, I'm Oprah, it's my job to ground people because I'm the wicked witch and I want to be difficult and awkward and challenging. It's about risk assessment and it's about our requirement to comply with the regs and with ICAO to make an informed assessment of whether or not this person is safe or unsafe with regard to all of the circumstances that could be there. So we need to make an informed risk assessment. So an analogy that was shared with me with an Air New Zealand pilot, um, pilot who is a peer was just to say that when we're doing these things and making these decisions about people being able to fly with diseases or not, it's just like when he decides as a captain of Air New Zealand um, uh, to go with an aircraft that is not completely serviceable, but it's still safe. And he, that's what the departure deviation guides are for. That's what they do. But you don't just wing it as the captain of the aircraft. You do check the guide and you look at all the parameters that allow in that guide that allow you to depart with that aircraft and you discuss it with engineering, the authority who can do that. To be able to reference the departure deviation guide and to get advice from and, and confirmation and sign off from the engineers, you need information. And that's why CASA wants those things, because this is the information that we need to be able to make a decision. No information, no decision. Limited or um, inadequate or, or vague information, again, no decision. That's really hard. So that's why CASA wants those things. The information that we're asking for, we're not making it up just because we want to be difficult. We are referring to 
um, the evidence-based practice guidelines published by the specialty colleges for that disease state or for that medical condition or for that problem. So, for example, the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Ophthalmologists says that for people under the age of 80 with raised intraocular pressure or glaucoma, they should have their eye assessment done every 12 months. So that's what we ask for. Go and see your ophthalmologist every 12 months. I'm not doing that to be difficult. I'm doing that because Ramsco says that's what you should be doing and they are the experts. What gets tricky is when your eye doctor or your optician says, nah, don't worry about it. Well, we've got a departure deviation guide. We've got the clinical guidelines from that college. That's what we're following. And we have to follow those because we are, you know, we're the National Aviation Authority. We can't just wing it and make it up. We've got to follow those guides in the same way your engineer's got to follow those guides. They can't just go, nah, she's right, mate. So that's the required information. That's why CASA wants that. So I've put together a kidney stone uh, example just to talk through that. Um, someone who has kidney stones, for us to be able to say whether or not it's okay for you to fly or risk treatments are going to be okay to have a medical certificate, we need a whole bunch of information. So we need to know um, how big is it, where is it, have you ever had this kind of stuff before? Are there any other stones there and how many and how big are they? And if it does move, is it going to cause a problem? Is it going to cause pain? Um, how likely will it be to cause pain and how bad that will, will that pain be? Can we crystal ball that and predict it? And no, we can't. We can't predict that kind of pain. Um, and is there anything we can do to make it so that you're going to be okay? And, um, yeah, we can do multi-crew or safety pilot for kidney stones. But we need all that information. So if all we get is a letter from the urologist that says there's a small stone but I don't think it's a problem and I think he's fit to fly, you know, that's not enough because they're not the engineer signing off this departure deviation guide. We are. So we need the information to make the decision. So I don't need his letter and his advice. I need his information. And you will see when our letters go out, Please provide this, 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 and this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then again, after the stone's gone, again, can I fly now? Is it a clean certificate? How often do I need those scans? Why does CASA need another ultrasound or another CT scan? Because we need information to know whether or not it is safe, or at least it's not unsafe, or the degree of unsafety is acceptable on likelihood, consequence, Risk treatments, are they effective risk treatments? What's the resi residual risk and is that okay? We need that information to be able to make that decision. We're not just making it up to be difficult. We need the information. Information. All right, so why won't CASA listen? I've already mentioned that a little bit. It's not about what your specialist doctor thinks about being an expert in that disease and body part. It is about what the aerospace medicine specialists understand in the context of all of the things you need to be able to do in all of the reasonable circumstances where you could be flying and what you could be flying and how you could be flying it. It's not about the disease. It's about the disease in aviation. It's not about medicine. It's about aerospace medicine. And that's why it's not necessarily just up to what that specialist said. Yes, your dame is an aerospace medicine expert. They don't have delegations in Australia to make the decision. CASA has. Our regs are about us making the decisions at CASA, so we need that information and we need the set of information. So it's not just what they say. It's not that we're not listening. And like I said, it is about following the regs that we have to follow. Um, and using the information that we have to use and having that information. So again, um, why aren't we listening? Well, because we need to have all the information. The kidney stone example is now that I've got the information, I can put that into a calculator so I can understand likelihood, consequence, degree of impairment, and we do know what the textbook says about the risk assessment and so on, and we have put the aerospace aerospace risk assessment on it about safety pilots and things. So that's what we've got. My urologist says I'll be fine. Not the expert. If we were to follow the advice, that, again, the engineering analogy seems to resonate reasonably well um, with, with doctors and with, um, with pilots and controllers. Um, think of it like there is a problem with your engine. There is a fault in the engine and it could get pretty untidy with that engine. 
And you're saying to the laymi, look, my mechanic, he's a really good mechanic. He's a real expert. He knows engines inside and out. He's absolutely fabulous. He, he, I've told him what's going on, and he says it's going to be fine. So could you just sign it off for me, please? The laymi's got to take responsibility for signing it off based on limited information from someone who's not an expert. Would a laymi do that? I don't know. Maybe that's for discussion later. I would like to think they wouldn't. But that's what you're doing when you're saying to Ahmed, just sign it off. That person says it's fine. Mm. We can't just sign it off. We're not allowed to under the regs, and it's not a safe thing to do. Okay. Next big ticket item. Why is Katha so slow? Thank you, Mr. Bean. Why are we so slow? Um, because all of the information that we need, we have to verify. Trust, but verify. We need to understand what's going on. We need to look. We need to read. We need to reflect. We need to refer. We need to research. At the very start, I said, gosh, it would be easy if it's just easy. It's easy when it's easy. And a lot of things are easy, and those medicals go out pretty quickly. But when it's not easy, we have to verify. We can't just trust and say, you know what, we'll just go with it. We'll just take their word for it. We'll just go with it. We have to verify. And that takes time. One of the biggest delays that we've got is awaiting information. So of the 1,700 medicals that are in the system at the moment, 700 of those are waiting for information from the applicant. We will send a request for information that says, please provide us with the following information. And not infrequently, we get a piece of information. We've got to send another letter. Thank you. Can we have the rest? And then we get another piece. Thank you. That's great. We're now two months down the track. We're still waiting. Just what we asked for at the last medical, we told you to do it for this medical, and now we've done it for this medical, but you didn't give it all. It's all on the list. Please give us this information. We need it. We can't make a decision without the information. And I've talked about why that is. We're not allowed to. We need to know if it's safe. We need to do the risk assessment. Please give us some of the information. We also have a lot of delays when the correspondence is not about please, please and sort of dragging it out of people, but it's arguing. Oh, well, I don't think I should give you that information, but we need it. But my doctor says I don't have to do it. But your doctor's the car mechanic, not the lamey. We're the lamey. We're the ones that need to make the information decision. So we need it. So please, 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 can we have it? So the delays are often about just waiting for that information and it would be just so beautiful if we get all of the information in one go. And for those of you who do go and see um, see your, your doctor and say, look, I've got this letter from Avged, can you, can you send, send something to them about it? Just remind them. They don't want to know if you think I'm fit to fly. They want to know all the information in the letter. And that will definitely make a difference to that 700 out of the 1700. Let's get those those certificates issued or managed or, or, or dealt with much faster. Awaiting information. The other thing that takes time is 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 attending to the risk assessment of individualised. Now, if we had a really simple decision tree for a blanket rule, we got to go for the lowest common denominator on that. And the lowest common denominator is usually more restrictive, less permissive. It's a bit unfair, but that's not my case. Well, that's the rule and that's it. So it doesn't allow us to find that way and to be more permissive, which we're required to do under the regs. Um, but it's more risk averse and less fair if we do it. So it takes time to go into each case individually rather than just to push them out and just say no to everything. It does take time. Um, the other thing is that we've got to do it all. So almost all of that 28,000, almost all of those are all coming through CASA. There's a lot of work to be done there. Um, Damies can absolutely send, um, do those class twos. Uh, every Damie can access that delegation. There's some online training and we're going to be doing that, um, not just the online training, we're going to be doing some webinars for the rest of this year to, to really bring those Damies on board with that. I, you really want to see all Damies exercising the Damie 2 delegation. Don't send them to us. Issue them yourselves, absolutely. As long as they don't have a psychosis or epilepsy or I've forgotten the dementia, as long as they don't have any of those, off you go. Follow the clinical practice guidelines. Follow the college guidelines. Make your own decision for those class twos. Don't send them to us. So otherwise, though, 28,000, so maybe 2,000 by Damie 2, so 26,000 certificates with CASA. So that takes time. Lots, lots going on. I need that Taylor Swift t-shirt. Got a lot going on right now. Got a lot, not not a lot. So 
are we really all that slow? Well, yeah, we. I know we are a bit slow with some of them, but but in actually a lot of cases we're not that slow. So we have an auto issuance option with our um with our MRS. That means that 40% of medicals just go straight out. And, and, you know, a lot of pilots, controllers, and Dame is on the call here. Before you've left the doctor's office, ping, there's your medical. Look at that, straight through. That's awesome. Um, so 40% of medicals go straight through. I should put that house thing up here. Everybody lies again. 40%, no problems. The next, of the remaining 60%, 40%, um, are issued by the assessors. So they come in, we have a look, can't quite auto issue, but they can have a look at some parameters and some decision trees. They can maybe ring the doc and say, hey, what do you think? Out it goes really, really quickly. And then it's just the last 20% out of your total 100 that end up with the doctors. Um, and they're the ones that we've got to look at. And they're the ones that will say, oh, you've got a kidney stone. Okay, well, it'd be great if you could send us some information about that. What stone? How big? Where is it? Have you had them before? Has it blocked off? Do you have any symptoms? Can we get a scan? We're going to have to ask you for information about that. And then once you send it to us, we've got to do that risk assessment. Really rare diseases, we've got to do the research. Wow, how does this one affect whether or not this person can or can't do what they need to do to fly their aeroplane in all reasonable circumstances? We've got to research that. We're going to ring, we're going to email the FAA or the UK and we're going to ask New Zealand and we're going to check in with Canada and we're going to find out what do we do with this one? This is really rare. We've got to take it to complex case meeting. We're going to ask other doctors to, hey, can you have a look at this one? Because this is really tricky. And that takes time. And all the while, gosh, those phones are ringing. So the assessors, as well as trying to push out their medicals, they're on the phone to people say, where is my medical? <laughs> yeah, I would be doing it if I wasn't on the phone to you. The emails, I got another email, where's my medical? Yep, there you go. Um, and all of these new applications coming in. Every week we've got to manage all of those. But we're still doing not too bad. And, you know, the the, the report from this week, 79% of the medicals are issued within that, that four-week period for 20 business days. And we make sure that the damies are extending them. We are giving extensions. We don't want anybody to be operationally impacted by the fact that we haven't done their medical yet. So are we all that slow? Yes, we are slow with some of them, but most of them, we're okay. How can we make it so that we're less slow? Um, coming to the end now of my talk, so hang in there, guys. Um, we do want those Damy 2s to start doing the Class 2 medicals so that the Damy is the one that is saying, oh, you got a kidney stone. Well, let's get that scan and put it together, and they can do it right there in their office. Um, probably still send us the hard ones, but they'll do it right there in their office. Um, and remember, we, we're looking for other ways that we can try to have more of those easy medicals assessed by the doctors at the coalface, by the damies, and not having to the doc to come to the doctors in Canberra if we possibly can. But remember, there is legislation that we can't just ignore. Part 67 will be reformed to enable this to happen, but how long does it take to make laws happen? It takes a while. Um, we're giving people the opportunity to not have to come into AVMED with their medical. So the Class 5 has been launched and there's, I think it's seven or 800 now, Class 5 self-declared had been done. And looking on the GA work plan that we're going to have a Class 4 where your usual GP um, can issue a Class 4 certificate rather than having to do by um, AVMED doctors within Part 67. And of course, we've got the good old basic class two exemption. We've got the recreational aviation medical practitioner certificate and your ASAOs are under part 149. They can do their own medical assessments for gliding and for recreational and for sports. We're also looking at trying to make things a bit easier. So we're not just sitting here fat, dumb and happy back in Canberra going, do whatever. We are trying to find ways to make it work. We really are um, while answering 400 phone calls and 450 emails and doing 400 medicals every week, we're still trying to make it better. Um, so I take solutions to give opportunities to make it smoother and faster and to risk assess and triage more effectively, supporting the assessors to make those decisions. It doesn't have to go into the doctor's tray, making it so that the doctors are more able and more accessible with greater capacity to do more if we possibly can. So I'm going to clone everybody. We are doing what we can. All right. So in summary, I talked about um, being the Wicked Witch and grounding everybody and that we really don't. Only three out of every thousand medicals are ones that are, that are, um, are not issued, so about 100 every year at the most. And 
we do have to follow the regs and we do have to follow the rules. We're not doing things just to be difficult. We do have to do an informed risk assessment with all of the information that's necessary and the time and the attention to do that full risk assessment process to get to the point that only three out of every thousand certificate end up being refused or cancelled. This is my three musketeers. I call them my three musketeers about risk assessment is be aware that we have to trust people, even though we think we might not be able to trust them and there are rules for us to follow. All right, let's have a look at these questions. Let me stop sharing. Let me go in, yeah, stop presenting. Let me go into the chat and see what you have got for me. So I'm gonna scroll back up to the top of the chat and see what everyone's got. Hello, Vicky from Wollongong and Richard. Um, okay. And Carl. So common practice and CASA requirements. Um, CASA requirement to send a grounding certificate to CASA if they're deemed not fit and while you're doing the workup. That is such a good question, Kevin. Thank you for asking that. So the regs require um, the DAMI to tell CASA that somebody has a safety relevant problem within five days of the DAMI knowing that they that, that problem exists. Is it safety relevant? You may not know it's safety relevant until you've done the workup. So all I've got right now when they talk to you is abdominal pain. Please don't send us a notification, I've got a pilot with abdominal pain. You've got to work that up. I don't know, if, you don't know if it's safety relevant yet. So your obligation as a DAMI to report it to CASA is within five days. The certificate holder for class one, they've got to tell Tell CASA or a DAMI within seven days. For class two and three, they've got to tell CASA or a DAMI within 30 days that they've got a problem. But if it's the DAMI that they tell, you've got five days to tell us if it's safety relevant. But you're allowed to do the workup to decide if it's safety relevant. And this is where that little bit of grey comes in that get your scans, get your specialist report, get your bloods, do your assessment, make your diagnosis. Now you know it's safety relevant and you know what it is and you know what you need and you can give us some information for a risk assessment so you do have a bit of flex. Please don't kick it down the road. I would suggest that 30 days is not unreasonable. So if you haven't figured out what's going on with this person and whether or not it's safety relevant within 30 days, I would hope that it's severe enough that there's your decision, it is safety relevant or it's probably gone away by now and turns out it wasn't safety relevant. So I hope that answers your question, Kevin, and thank you for asking that. Um, pro forma letters, Vicky, thanks for asking that. Um, the clinical practice guidelines have got the text of information required. So when you look at the letters that we send out, that's what it is. So a treating doctor report that includes confirmed diagnosis, um, recommended treatment, prognosis, management plan, all that kind of thing. They're all the things that we want you to be asking. Now, for the Dany 2s, we're working on the IT solution to make it so that you have the suite of CASA templates. Make it super easy that you can select that letter. You can edit the letter if you need to. Please don't edit them too much because the idea of a template is it's a template. If you want to do a straight up letter of your own free text, then do it yourself. But we're going to be making our templates available for the Dami 2s to use those. So there you go. Um, and then, so Hayden, thank you for asking a question and hello. Um, so uh, safety incidents, challenge flights from RAOs affecting our aeronautical decision making. Um, I mean, only if you tell us about them. So um, uh, the ASAOs um, conduct their own investigations, potentially with the support of the ATSB, but they would only come to the attention of CASA if ATSB deems it necessary, that uh, if they know that somebody also holds a CASA certificate as well as their ASAO one, and it's a safety relevant issue that we need to know about. So it's not a natural kind of given um, information sharing process. Um, it's completely up to, um, the ASAO, so RAOs in your questions case, and it for it to be investigated and for it to be determined that CASA really needs to know about this. So it's not automatic. All right, what else have we got? 
eerily quiet on the chat. I wonder what else is going on there. There's, there's a Q&A thread as well, is there? Do I need to look at that too? Um, yes, thank you. All right. Um, an HbA1c to exclude diabetes and borderline glucose results. Now we look. We can we prefer the GTT because it gives us that sense of impaired glucose tolerance, um, as opposed to impaired fasting glucose. You had your high glucose. A1c says you're okay, but do they have impaired glucose tolerance? Because that's an important data point for the cardiovascular risk assessment. That's important um, as a as an, an element of that. So that's the benefit of the GTT is it arrived, it gives us better granularity in terms of where is this person on that. Once they've had a GTT and we know where they are, perhaps after that, maybe the A1C would be reasonable to say we haven't gone beyond that, but there you go. Um, yeah. Uh, Derek, you asked, why didn't my Damien know that they can issue? Um, I'm going to be a little bit unkind here, perhaps because they didn't read the Damien newsletter or they haven't dialed into Damien Grand Rounds, the monthly webinars, they haven't come to one of our conferences in the last I don't know how long. Dami 2 delegation has been live for, I want to say, five or six years as an option. And, I mean, gosh, I'll bang on about it all the time. Damies, get in there. Do it. Please, please, please. Um, Hayden, again, thank you. Does the self-declared replace the BC2? Um, it's it's sort of um, sort of not sort of, but not really. So the BC2 requires a medical practitioner to sign it off, whereas the self-declared doesn't. So probably the future class four, where a doctor is involved in, always involved in the decision, is what will replace the basic class two, and it will be more permissive than the basic class two. So it's pretty tight. The unconditional commercial driver's license standard is a pretty tight standard. That's your BC2. The class four is going to be more permissive than that. So, so there you go. Um, all right, so just going through the, the threads here. Um, what have I got? MRS asks for comments on the ECG. So, yeah, thank you for, for raising that one. That's another IT fix that we're having a good look at that um, to give an option for not applicable. So if it's not required for this medical, you can click not, not applicable. What we don't want is for you to then be able to do not applicable and not bother reading the ECG if you did do one. So we're just working through making sure that the IT will work the way it needs to work. So if you do need to do an ECG, then you interpret it. And if it wasn't required for this medical, then you can do a not applicable. So watch this space for that one. We're going to get there. Um, okay, now, Jacob, I'm just going to try to open that one. Um, so, yeah, integrating expert evaluations into the decision-making process. We drill down into immense detail with that, um, particularly the likelihood consequence um, situation. So we go into the medical literature and we put together that says there is a 4.3% likelihood that this person with this disease of this severity on this treatment in this way will have this problem in the next 12 months. And that's what we do. And we do it that way because the regs require us to. We also do it that way because if it comes to it and we're at tribunal or we're in front of the coroner or we're in front of the ATSB or the commissioner or whatever, we have to explain why we made that decision. And that's what we do. We spell it out in really, really granular detail, literature, evidence review. Often when we get a letter from the treating doctor, they say, well, I disagree and I think this person's risk is 0.5%. Our review says 4.5% and here's all the journal articles and here's why. Your doctor says 0.5%. But what they haven't done is told us why it's so different. And often they just say, because I say. And that's not enough. That gets back to go back to that in engineering because the, the non lamey said they think it's fine, but they haven't referred to the departure deviation guide. They haven't gone to the engineering standards. They haven't gone to the aerospace medical, all of that. They've just said, I think. And that's a really big issue for us is that we need more than I think. We need them to tell them why they think that. What, why am I wrong? Prove me wrong. I've got my evidence. Show me your evidence. And I think is not evidence, unfortunately. So I hope that answers that question for you a little bit there, Jacob. Um, now, Rolf, yeah, great. Look, great question. How are we, uh, what are we doing about increasing DAMI numbers and offering training? So CASA doesn't have capacity to offer training or sort of a scope to offer training. 
Um, it's up to external bodies to put together training courses. Um, regrettably, the Monash course disappeared during COVID and, and with some staffing changes. Um, the defence course, of course, they're training about 40 aviation medical officers per year who are damies if they choose to apply. The society is running a couple of courses. We're about to enter into an MOU with ANU and hopefully they were looking at offering courses. Um, but courses are epically labour intensive and quite expensive, of course, to run because they're so labour intensive. And CASA doesn't deliver damie training like CASA doesn't deliver flying training. Um, we will do what we can. We show up, we support, we advise, we do things, we, we help as much as we can, but we can't really do it ourselves. It's up to the market, I guess, to make it happen. Um, there you are. Now, Sharon has asked about the PREDICT um, calculator. Um, the, um, the New Zealand PREDICT calculator that is embedded with MRS is embedded because it was available early before Australia got our act together. It's also embedded because the coding was available um, and, and open source coding. In fact, the Australian cardiovascular risk is a little bit more permissive and is a bit more generous. It really only differs over the age of 50. Under the age of 50 is not much in it. We will accept either the MRS predict calculator or if you do the Australian one, is the Australian one is now predict. It's just it's the Australianized predict from, um, from the New Zealand team. Whichever one you do, we will accept which one. The one that MRS does, or if you want to do your own, print it, upload it, we'll take that one as well. Um, I can't possibly keep up with all of your questions, but um, let's uh, let's have a look. Um, so, Kim, um, autonomy in grounding and ungrounding and clearing and so on, and calling for advice. Um, Again, one of those tricky ones, um, we don't have like an on-call roster because, again, our doctors are, uh, are not as accessible or as available as that, something that we're looking at perhaps as doing that. Um, but you can certainly clear them back to flying if you have done all of the assessment and all of the things that you need to do for it to determine that it's not safety relevant. And that's that DAMI clearance required sort of situation. But if it's something that will affect their medical certificate because it is, is safety relevant and it's ongoing, then, yes, that's got to come to CASA for us to do that. So daily clearance, daily clearance required. We're happy for you to do that as long as it's not things that will actually require certificate action, things like restrictions or conditions or a long time off, that sort of thing. Um, Gordon, thank you for the question. ADHD, OCD, perhaps the anxiety spectrum and the mood disorders and so on and generally mental health. The main consideration points are the same as, I guess, the same as everything else. So how severe is it? Is it treated? Does it cause impairment? What kind of impairment does it cause? Is there any way we can prevent that impairment from impacting on whether or not an event is going to happen because of that hazard being present? How reliable is that? How predictable? They're all the things that we look at, whether it's for ADHD or psychotic illnesses or, or gallstones or whatever. So they're the main considerations. We look at um, all the information that comes in from the psychologist, from the treating doctor, from the paediatrician, if there was one involved. It might be neuropsych assessment. It might be school reports about how well they're um, performing or have been at school. It might even be operational reports from the flying school or from the check and training captain that's doing their, their sim checks and so on. They're all the things that we look at overall. Um, watch this space for mental health. We're doing a huge amount of work, particularly with um, New Zealand CAA, to look at changing the way we approach mental health certification. Um, I've talked a lot about that. I won't go into that in detail, but we are uh, hopefully going to give a lot more information about how those decisions are made in mental health and allowing Damies to, um, to be aware of all of that. Um, Pete, that's a really great point. So a zero risk approach, we know it's never going to be zero risk. And uh, every year there are fatalities in aviation in Australia. Um, so um, how many health related air incidents have happened? We don't really have an answer to that because people don't report them. And that's really, really hard. So we don't know how many near misses there are and whether or not that near miss is because this person is on Valium for their back pain. We don't even know the near miss happened because they didn't report that near miss. So this is a really big gap. The evidence that we need to be able to say, do you know what? All of these people are taking Valium and none of them had an accident. All of these people are taking 
Redolin for ADHD and none of them had an accident or they did have a near miss, but it actually turned out just fine because all of these things happen. We need them to be reported. We need them to be reported honestly and consistently and comprehensively. We need them to be analysed for whether or not what happened actually is a medical issue or not, a human performance issue or not. Um, that There's so much to that question. I'm really glad you asked it, but there's so much to it. But we really, if we don't have data, then we just have to go with what we've got. Uh, knowledge is power, information is power. We need people to report things. What happened? How did it happen? Why did it happen? I need to look across the fence to the ATSB and say, you guys need to investigate these. You need to make it possible. If you look at the ATSB occurrence reports on their website, there is no way to identify the, the incident pilot. Uh, do pilots want to tell us? Do they want to declare to the ATSB, yep, that was me. This aircraft did this thing on this day. Yep, that was me. No, they report the aircraft, but not the pilot in command. That's going to be a hard one. Nobody's going to want to say that. We've only got a few. I'm just going to flick back to the chat rather than the Q&A and see if there's anything in there. Um, so, uh, so Rolf, we, we did do um, we did do an MRS um, update for the uh, the changes to MRS, the diagnosis, current medications, and so on. Double documenting, double coding, double data entry. Sorry, that's going to be fixed. There's a there's some phases of of MRS fixing. The idea of that would be like it's kind of like having the health summary page on your medical software that it's really easy to find instead of digging into different screens. That's the intent. Regrettably, it wasn't as refined as it ought to have been when it was rolled out, but it will be. So that's the plan. So you can just quickly click, click on that. I know what's going on for this pilot or controller, and there it is, front and center. So super easy. That's the idea. Um. Uh, Robert, can CASA access life insurance industry data on the probability of certain medical events or conditions occurring? Um, I mean, the short answer, if they publish it and make it accessible to us, I guess we can. Um, but it's not something that we, I can't just ring up, um, you know, Medibank and say, how many of your members have had these things happening to you? We, um, uh, births, births, deaths and marriages are the registries of each state. Uh, who died and what did they die from? Uh, and cross-referencing the fact of the fact that they died and what they died from with whether or not they held a medical certificate. It, it's even really hard for us to access that data. Lots of privacy, lots of rules and regs around what we can access and, and how and why. We're not allowed to jump on My Health Record. We're not allowed to get on SafeScript. We're not allowed to do any of that. There's huge privacy rules around all of that. So it is pretty hard for us to access that. We kind of need them to publish that data and then we grab that data and apply it to our population. So it's a tricky one, I'm sorry. All right, let me scroll back up. What else have you got for me? You've all been very kind, actually, with your Q&A. Maybe there's not so many pilots on the call. I don't know. They're going to have a look at that and email it to us afterwards. Um, scrolling. Um, all right. Um. Publishing Aviation Savvy Doctors. I'm just going to try to find where that one popped up. I saw it pop up and now I can't see it. Publishing Aviation Savvy Doctors on the website. Um, yeah, look, it is something we're already doing. So there's um, a tab in the website to find an aviation cardiologist, um, which uh, we've, we've, there's a few names on that one. The ANU uh, agreement, uh, ANU is going to start delivering some aviation specialty familiarisation courses for non-GP specialists to access. And the intent is that those doctors, again, will put their hand up and be on the on the website. So, so CASA accredited aviation consultants is what they'll be called. Click on that tab and then search by specialty. And those doctors will have done the FAMIL course so they understand about decision making, about risk assessment, about what CASA needs and why. They're not going to be the ones that will send that I think they're fit to fly. They'll be the ones that send us all the information that you'll get a quick decision and an effective decision. Um, and you're going to be one of the 997 out of 1,000 who get your certificate. There you go. Um, insurance actuaries, well, let's talk to, let's talk to HR about a employing more public servants. I'm not sure if we're allowed to do that. Um, yeah, so there you go. All right, so it's 7 o'clock. Um, that's our hour. I've been talking for an hour. You all know I can go on, but I think I've gone on enough. Um, so I will finish up there. Thank you so much for dialing in. Thank you for asking your questions. Um, 
a CPAP. Oh, I know. That's a hard one um, just for CPAP. I, um, how do we measure how impaired you are by how severe your sleep apnea is? We can't measure that. We can't predict that. We do know that you are there's a whole range of reasons why untreated sleep apnea is not acceptable. What's got to happen is the, the safety pilot has got to know that you're not thinking clearly. But how can they know that? And that's a, that, that means your risk treatment is not operating and effective. So that means it's not, not, not one that we can use. Um, questions in MRS, um, uh, yes, they, 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 we are working on them. Uh, that's a very short answer, but um, we are working on them. All right, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the chat now so I stop talking and don't look at any more questions. We have recorded it so we can see if there's anything else that we need to answer. Thank you, pilots. Thank you, air traffic controllers. Thank you, Damies. Thank you, doctors, for dialing in. Really great to see you. I'll see the doctors there uh, for our next Damie Ground Round, which is going to be Damie 2. Get your Damie 2, please. All right. Knock it off. Thank you and good night.